Hello everyone and welcome or welcome back to the Brain Boost channel. So today's topic is going to be homeostasis and this is actually part one of two videos on homeostasis. So let's just jump right in. So let's actually get into the definition of homeostasis. It's essentially dynamic equilibrium. So these two words are actually really good and um, kind of encompass exactly what homeostasis is. Um, and that is because your body is essentially always trying to kind of maintain this balance in keeping your, your systems and your health in check at a balanced level. Uh, which is the equilibrium that we're talking about here. And uh, it's, it does this in certain ways, and it can be v it's very dynamic in achieving this. So basically, it's just the method by which your systems achieve this equilibrium internally for you to keep you healthy and alive. Um, and you have contribution by and to all your systems to maintain this this internal equilibrium. Um, so there are actually three components to uh, achieving or maintaining homeostasis. And those are uh, a receptor that's going to pick up on a certain signal of something that might be off, uh, which is going to send the signal to the control center, which is going to sort of compute the signal and decide what to do. And that signal on what to do, so to speak, is going to be sent to the effector where um, the actions are essentially taken and you hopefully go back to homeostasis or that equilibrium. So these are some uh, basic concepts for, for all my first year anatomy students. Uh, so you should really drill in. Um, and get to know some of the stuff we're going to talk about in this video because it's going to come back kind of in a lot of future courses throughout your uh, throughout your undergrad. So we're going to talk about right now um, negative and positive feedback loops. So these are just kind of um, uh, systems that are going to either enhance or repress certain stimuli. So let's talk about the negative feedback loop first. It's actually the most used fees feedback system in your body um, and kind of the more you learn about the human body the more you'll you'll begin to notice this negative feedback system term being used for a lot of different things. So what happens here is that you get some sort of um, reception of a signal maybe you know a certain hormone is too high or something is off too high or too low which is going to send that signal to your control center for you know uh, computing once again like i said to figure out what to do um, and the response is going to be to reduce or turn off that stimulus that initial stimulus that was picked up so if we look here we can see a uh, a little uh, schematic here on a negative feedback loop and so the the little guy in the middle, he is going to be our uh, equilibrium, the homeostasis. And uh, let's say it gets a little bit too hot, so your body temperature increases. Um, that's going to be our stimulus. And our brain is going to say, oh, we're really hot. We need to cool off. And that's going to activate our cooling mechanisms. So we're going to start to sweat to cool ourselves down. And that's going to decrease our uh, body temperature. And the same goes in the opposite way. If it gets too cold, we're going to start to shiver to generate heat until our body temperature increases and we're back to this normal body temperature. So as you can see here, depending on what kind of stimulus we have, we have different responses that are going to turn them off or reduce them to bring us back to normal, so to speak. Now, a positive feedback loop is actually just the enhancement of that initial stimulus. Whatever that is, um, your brain is kind of telling it to keep going and um, do it more. So let's get into an actual example of, you know, when that would happen. Why would your body ever encourage something to keep being produced or keep getting um, more and more intense? So an example of positive feedback loop is birth, actually. So uh, someone that is pregnant, that is 
um, almost or full term about to give birth. Uh, their baby, their baby's head is going to push against the cervix, and that's actually going to um, get transmitted to the brain, those impulses. Uh, and your brain is going to cause um, the secretion of something called oxytocin, which I'm sure we've heard of before. So this oxytocin is going to be carried into the bloodstream, to the uterus, and it's stimulating more contractions. So it's it's heightening or amplifying that initial stimulus, that uh, that little push of the baby's head. It's pushing it more. It's continuing to push it more until you actually give birth. So this is a positive feedback loop. So let's actually get into how we can regulate homeostasis. It's, it's definitely more complicated than just um, stimulus, you know, uh, sends it to your brain to figure out what to do with it and then response. It's a lot more complex than that. Um, but two major systems that regulate your homeostasis is the nervous system and the endocrine system. So we know the nervous system deals with, you know, um, the, the nerves and neurons and projecting everything out onto your peripheral nervous system. And if we're not sure what these words mean yet, I'm going to get into that in this video, so no worries. Um, so, you know, nervous system is all electrical impulses. We kind of know that already. And then the endocrine system is hormones. It's dealing with the um, glands that are going to release certain hormones into your bloodstream to a, a target area. So today's video is only focusing on the nervous system aspect, which is why this is part one. And part two, we're going to focus on the endocrine and hormonal aspect of everything um, because it's a lot to put into one video. So today's only going to be on the nervous system. And if we look at this schematic here, this is pretty much uh, a really good summary of what you need to um, know at the, at the larger scale on how everything connects together. Um, this will definitely come up on your exams, uh, f even in multiple choice, you know, trying to trump you on different wording here or different associations. I'll get into all of that right now. So essentially your nervous system is divided into two major compartments, right? Your central nervous system and your peripheral nervous system. So your CNS and PNS. Now, um, just to help us remember everything and keep track of everything that goes on, our central nervous system is just really made up of the brain and the spinal cord. That's all you really need to associate the central nervous system with. Just think in this image here, brain and spinal cord. These are the most central things in your body. And the peripheral nervous system is essentially kind of everything outside of that, all the neurons and fibers that are extending outwards from your central nervous system, that's all peripheral. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of extra divisions within our peripheral nervous system. Uh, but first, I want to draw our attention to these two divisions here. So obviously, like I said, um, our uh, nervous system has kind of um, an input division and an output division. You need to have something to input to get to the central nervous system where it's going to um, kind of understand and figure out what's going on and then come up with a res resolution where it's going to output that. So the inputting area is actually called the afferent division and the output is the efferent division. So be sure to uh, remember that because those will definitely come up in your tests or exams. So I want us to focus on the efferent division on all the responses that are going to be coming outwards to the rest of our body. So we have two divisions once again. There's a lot of subsections here uh, of our efferent division of our peripheral nervous system. So we have the somatic and the autonomic. Uh, this isn't too difficult at this point here. Um, it's really just the somatic nervous system deals with, you know, motor neurons and skeletal muscles. You really just want to think of voluntary um, movement, which is muscles, really. 
um, and your autonomic nervous system think automatic so you don't have any um, planning this is all done involuntarily it's automatic right that's your autonomic nervous system and it's going to branch again into our sympathetic and our parasympathetic nervous systems so our sympathetic nervous system is kind of our fight or flight and our parasympathetic nervous system is the rest and digest system so we're going to get into um, more details on these uh, divisions and subdivisions but this image um, I strongly encourage for everyone to uh, really properly study and make sure that you can even you know grab a piece of paper and try to draw out this schematic yourself and if you can then you know you're definitely set on the basics here so like I said I, I want us to focus here on the autonomic nervous system for a second um, and the autonomic nervous system controls, you know, the involuntary responses of our body. And we have two divisions, sympathetic, the fight or flight, and the parasympathetic, the, um, the rest and digest. As you can see here, um, this is just a, another image. So this is the, the juicy part of the lecture I'm sure that you've seen in class, and that might have confused you even. So I just want us to break everything down really well and I want us to fully understand everything that's going on here um, because this is another really important slide. Uh, this diagram I've seen everywhere for anatomy classes uh, and it's always referenced on the exam. So let's go through everything and let's make sure we all understand what's going on here. So basically what we're looking at here are neurons right we're looking at neurons and their projections as you can see they have projections uh, also known as you know axons as you can see here the term axon and they're all going to project onto something they're going to project onto whatever something and release certain uh, neurotransmitters and onto um, you know certain uh, target organs uh, and that's going to have different types of effects. That's just the flow of everything that's happening here, right? We have our, our original, the cell bodies of our neurons located in the central nervous system, right? Central, so our brain or spinal cord. Um, that's where the cell bodies are located on. And then the axons project into our peripheral nervous system. So, like I said, we have... Um, different divisions, right? We said our peripheral nervous system, our PNS, is divided into the somatic and the autonomic, which has two other divisions, as we can see here. So that's what we're going to look at today. So this is all the peripheral nervous system that we're looking at here. So let's just take it from the top. Um, let's go, uh, you know, box by box and go through everything. So we have our the cell body of our neuron in the central nervous system and it's projecting you know the axon here it's projecting it outwards into the peripheral nervous system like i mentioned and as we can see here it is a just one long continuous axon right and here i want you to pay attention that it says that it's heavily myelinated so um, i'm hoping everybody knows what myelinated means uh if not um, for, for our beginners uh, into anatomy here. Myelination, a myelinated axon, myelin, is just this fat that's on your axon, on your neurons. It's this layer of fat that's on top here that is going to allow for the signal um, to transmit really fast. So the more myelination you have, the more myelin on your axon, the faster, the more speed you have in terms of signal transmission. So um, we have heavy myelination here, so it's very fast. This is definitely meant for speed, and it releases something called acetylcholine. This is the neurotransmitter here, um, and it's going to release it onto our skeletal muscles. And the effect here is always going to be stimulatory, right? We're always going to contract. You can even just move your hand right now. The signal is so fast that, you know, at any moment's notice, you can move your hand, you can move your foot, your leg, and it will 
always move. It's always going to contract your muscles. So that's kind of what this is explaining here. Uh, now, one thing you should be aware of, some, you know, you know, some side terminology that you're probably hearing in class is um, the term cholinergic. So because this is releasing acetylcholine, that makes our, um, our uh, neuron a cholinergic neuron. It's releasing acetylcholine, right? And that also makes the receptors here from our effector organs they're also going to be cholinergic receptors, right? Um, they're, they're receiving acetylcholine. That's what they respond to. So you should associate, you know, this somatic nervous system, um, the neuron, you know, schematic here with acetylcholine release. Um, they're cholinergic. You're always going to have a stimulatory effect because you're contracting muscles. That's what the result is, contraction. And it's very quick because it's heavily myelinated. That's just a little summary of everything that's going on here. So let's actually move on to the autonomic. So like I said, the autonomic nervous system is um, involuntary. And we said we have two different divisions, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So our fight or flight and the rest and digest. So uh, we have two kind of pathways that we can go through here for the sympathetic. Uh, nervous system and um, I want you to notice that instead of just one continuous axon like we see in the somatic nervous system we actually have two and they meet at something called the ganglion this this region where they meet the synapse the synapse they kind of a uh, release from one to another they synapse at the at this air this area where they meet called the ganglion and so uh, that means if this kind of uh, middle region here and here is the, the ganglion, so to speak, see ganglion, ganglion, we can see it later here, that means we must have a pre-ganglionic neuron and a post-ganglionic neuron. So that's kind of how you can keep up with, you know, the first and the second. It's pre and post. That's what they're called. And we can see it here, pre-post. So we have light myelination here of our preganglionic axon, uh, and it's going to release acetylcholine to our postganglionic neuron. Um, and this is also going to be non-myelinated here. So we go from light myelination to no myelination. And here it's going to release norepinephrine, which is NE. That's what NE stands for. If you saw just E, if you're ever confused in your notes, that just means epinephrine. Uh, so here we have norepinephrine release onto whatever organ, target organ, and um, their response could be stimulatory or inhibitory, depending on kind of the receptors, effector organs. That's a little bit situational here. But what we see is a preganglionic, lightly myelinated axon releasing acetylcholine. So this is cholinergic, right? The preganglionic neuron from the sympathetic nervous system here is cholinergic, as we can see. And the postganglionic axon here is actually not cholinergic. It's not releasing acetylcholine. It's called adrenergic, okay? It's releasing norepinephrine. So that's a little bit of a memorization thing that you have to do. And um, if we also look at the other pathway that we can go through here, we have our preganglionic axon, which is also lightly myelinated, releasing acetylcholine onto the adrenal medulla here. So here, once again, we have cholinergic preganglion, right? Releases acetylcholine. And um, that's going to kind of uh, stimulate uh, the adrenal medulla to release um, epinephrine and norepinephrine, and it's going to release that into the bloodstream, and that's going to travel and really go kind of anywhere in the body. It has like a system-wide effect because it's going into your bloodstream, which, which innervates, it's going everywhere. Your blood is all throughout your body. And um, once again, it's going to your organs, whatever target organ that it's trying to, whatever system it's trying to, you know, reach. 
and the result could be stimulatory or inhibitory. That's a bit situational. So um, what we can deduce from here is that our first path, the top here, is a lot more localized than the second path. The second path is going through the blood, right? So this is a lot more general, okay? Another thing that we can deduce from here is that just like in the somatic nervous system, we also notice that in the sympathetic nervous system, we have uh, cholinergic neurons, right? Our axons are cholinergic here. They're the preganglionic ones though, okay? So the preganglions are cholinergic for both the sympathetic pathways. Um, and then the postganglions are here, the postganglion and kind of this, this post uh, pathway, the continuation here, um, are adrenergic. We have epinephrine and norepinephrine release. These are adrenergic. And if we move on to the parasympathetic nervous system here, so once again, we have our, you know, the cell body of our neuron in the central nervous system, and it's projecting into the peripheral nervous system, and it is lightly myelinated. Our preganglionic axon, once again, we have a preganglion here, and it's lightly myelinated. It's going to release acetylcholine, so it is cholinergic. I'm hoping you um, said it before I did, if you're following. Um, at the ganglion, right, at the synapse, it's, it's going to synapse onto or kind of communicate onto the postganglionic axon, which is going to release, in this case, once again, acetylcholine. So in the parasympathetic nervous system, both the pre- and the postganglions are cholinergic here. So um, if we generally kind of compare somatic versus autonomic, the somatic system here, our effect is almost, it's always going to be stimulatory. It's cholinergic. It's always going to have stimulatory effects. We're always going to have muscle contraction. Whereas with the autonomic nervous system, the, stimul this, the effect could be stimulatory or inhibitory, um, depending on what we're releasing, right? Are we releasing acetylcholine or epinephrine? That depends. So that's kind of a big difference between the two that you can point out or that might be you know questioned but yeah definitely focus on these pre and post ganglions you will definitely be asked about these things and if they are cholinergic you know what they release or if they're adrenergic um, and what they release onto what their target organs are what the targeted effects are so um, hopefully this explanation really went into all the details that maybe you didn't understand in class so once again, um, kind of adding a bit from the last slide, this schematic is a little bit of a different representation of what we just talked about. Um, just a couple extra points to add on. So this is also another really common diagram I see in anatomy class in the first year or even like uh, late high school anatomy even possibly. So we have our... Uh, the, the vertical column here, we can see that is divided into different regions, right? The cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral, or sacral. And uh, there are um, different fibers that are originating from these different areas. Um, and they're kind of associated with either the sympathetic or the parasympathetic nervous systems. So let's actually get into that. So if we start with the parasympathetic nervous system, we have fibers that are here, we can see that uh, originate in the brain, or they're called cranial, and they're going to um, innervate or project onto you know, brain-like functions, like sight and things like that. Um, and we also see another group of fibers that are coming from the sacral region here. Um, and they're kind of going on to projecting to the bladder and whatnot. So the fibers from the parasympathetic nervous system are going to be called craniosacral because of where they're originating from. Craniosacral. Simple enough. And um, I'm sure you can also deduce that for the sympathetic nervous system then, because we see it mostly in the thoracic and lumbar region, it's going to be thoracolumbar. That's what's 
what you want to associate with the sympathetic nervous system. Um, I also want you, I also want to draw your attention to the actual fibers and how they're innervating here. So, um, as we can see with the parasympathetic nervous system, our uh, fibers, they're really close to the structures that need innervation here. As you can see, they are, they extend all the way, the, we can see the, um, the, uh, the ganglion that we talk about in the previous slide, you can always go back to that previous slide or even in your own class notes, you can have that previous slide, that diagram opened up on the side. And that ganglion there is pretty close to the, the effector organs, the organs that need to be innervated, right? So we have a very long uh, pre-ganglion here and a short post-ganglion. And uh, the opposite is true for the sympathetic nervous system. Most of our pre-ganglions are close to the spinal cord, so they're very short, and we can see here the ganglions, or the ganglia. And then we have our post-ganglionic axons, right? They're very long, they're further away from the, the target organs. So those are uh, some extra little associations and uh, little things that you need to know for your exam. So that is it for today's part one on homeostasis. Make sure to like this video and comment any other, you know, topics that you might be struggling or that are coming up in your finals since it's almost final season. Um, and subscribe to the channel. Most of uh, the Brain Boost viewers actually aren't subscribed. So make sure you subscribe and uh, sit tight for part two.